Well, in our current Sunday morning series, we've been hearing from Drew and from Taylor and Derek Joseph that the love that you have experienced and the truth that you have learned is not for you yourself alone, that there's a joy and there's a freedom in being released from the compulsion to orbit everything around oneself, as if every good thing you receive is to be mainly invested and spent on yourself. For we are blessed to be a blessing. And we've been exploring these past several weeks the many avenues and the opportunities that we have to share and to show the love of Christ. As Paul expressed to the believers at Colossae, pray for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. So we show the love of Christ by our good works, and we share it through our words. And this morning, we're going to explore one particular area by which we do this. Let's pray. Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we do rejoice and we receive from you so many marvelous things. This morning, we're particularly aware and receiving and worshiping, and being inspired, and being transformed by the reality, Lord Jesus, of your sacrifice for us. Thank you just for the songs we have, for your word, for these elements at the table, for one another, for the gifts that you've given to us that we can experience with each other. We thank you for these. And Lord, I pray that right now, that in the quietness of this moment, we'll be able to set aside Uh, everything that could distract us and that we'll enjoy reading your word and hearing from you and that Holy Spirit you will uh, enliven and quicken and teach and convict as only you can. We are so glad to be here. In Christ's name, amen. Well, when I sit at my desk in my office here at the church building, There are two unique, valued items within my view. And so as I sit and read and study, pray, write, or talk, as I do the work that is my calling, I have placed within my sight two meaningful artifacts that remind me of the toil and the meaning of faithful work. There's one item from each of my grandfathers that represent Uh, what they handled in the daily labors of their callings. My mom's dad was a rural route mail carrier for 40 years in northern Indiana. Uh, Enrolled as an an officer candidate school at the end of World War I, he provided for his family in the hardships of the Great Depression and then through World War II by being a mailman. So on my bookcase is a metal box about that big, in which we kept receipts uh, and money and stamps. And he set it right next to him as he drove 10,000 days delivering the mail. The same route, the same people out in the the, uh, rural area of that town. My dad's dad came home from the brutal trench warfare of World War I to scratch out a living in the hills of southern Indiana. Besides subsistence farming, he was a lumber and a machine man, felling trees and cutting them in his own sawmill, and he was active into his 80s. So leaning up against one of my walls is a three-foot-long measuring stick that he would use to be able to figure out how many board feet he was going to need or that he was going to be selling. So I'm humbled and I'm inspired by these silent reminders of my grandfathers that speak to me of the value of consistent, diligent labor to provide for their families, to serve the common good, and to do their work unto the Lord. Known in their communities to be the kind of men whose quiet lives of faithful work spoke loudly to the dignity and the godly purposes of labor. This morning we are going to explore how our work Mostly, our jobs, our vocation, can be an avenue to show and to share Christ. We're going to consider together 
What does God say about our work? What does he intend for it to be? How is it meant to reach beyond ourselves? And specifically, how can we share and show the love of Christ in it? So like my grandfathers, we all have, or we're going to have, a work history. So I wonder for you what your relationship is and has been to work. Not only the jobs you've had, but how you've expressed the joys of a task well done or the weariness of work that seemed to never end. I wonder who taught you the value of excellence and of follow-through or sadly modeled a discontentment that comes with pointless work. Well, understanding your own experiences and your orientation to work is a good place to begin, but even more significant is knowing what God designed and what he intends for our work lives. Our primary text is going to take us back to the very beginning when our Creator set in motion human existence and commissioned us to join Him in His work. So you can turn to Genesis 1. It should be easy to find. It's page 1. <laughs> I always wanted to say that. Turn to page 1 in your pew Bibles. We're going to look at verse 25 to 28. And then uh, chapter 2, the first two verses. So this is Genesis 1, 25 to 28. And this, of course, is the creation account. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish over the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. In chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done He rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. We're going to address two main questions today. What is the nature of work? And how do we respond to God's call for us to work? So the nature of work, and then how do we respond to this call that we've been given? First of all, what is the nature of work? Well, as we just read in this passage from Genesis, it's very rich in meaning, very familiar to many of us. It reveals aspects of what sort of God the Lord is, along with humanity's identity, purposes, and responsibilities. Well, for our purposes this morning, we are going to first observe that at the outset of all history, God describes himself as a worker, finding goodness in labor. Work was not beneath the Almighty God. The initial foundational claim of the Bible is that in the beginning, God made the heavens, God created the heavens and the earth. Then this is followed by Genesis 2, 1. Thus the heavens and earth were finished, and on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done. He rested on the seventh day from all of his work that he had done. So from the beginning, God worked. There are two Hebrew words for work. One refers to labor that's unskilled and raw. The other designates skilled labor. That's that is performed by a craftsman or an artisan. And so this second word is the one that's used here in Genesis to refer to the Lord's work. Thus, work is not a necessary evil. It is a part of the glorious paradise in which God created and man was living. In a most fascinating statement, Jesus affirmed that work is a part of God's nature and design. 
In John 5, 17, Jesus said, My Father is always at His work to this very day, and I too am working. My Father is always at His work to this very day, and I too am working. The creative God who works His will and His ways into the world shares much of Himself with the rest of creation and demonstrates Himself through it. He reaches the apex of this with humanity. The crowning quality of humanity is our distinctiveness. We read in verse 27, So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him, male and female. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over every living thing that moves on the earth. Man's uniqueness is declared in two fundamental ways. First, we are designed by God as His image bearers. We reflect to His world who the Creator is. We are intended to mirror God's creativity, His excellence, and His glory to the world. This means that you were created to worship the Lord and to display to those around you a glimpse of His nature and His character. Second, we're designed by God to exercise dominion over creation. We have been delegated to, to this, to this role of stewards. We're not owners, and without ultimate authority, we care for what belongs to Him in ways that honor and please and reflect His heart. We learn that the Lord not only works, He commissions mankind to continue His labor. So part of God's glory and joy is His work. And being made in His image, He has a unique role for us. We were created with work in mind. Pastor and author Tim Keller observed in his book, Every Good Endeavor, that mankind was created in a garden to be gardeners. He writes, We are to be gardeners who take an active stance toward their charge. They do not leave the land as it is. They rearrange it in order to make it fruitful, to draw the potentialities for growth and development out of the soil. They dig up the ground and rearrange it with the goal in mind, to rearrange the raw material of the garden so that it produces food, flowers, and beauty. And that is the pattern for all work. It is rearranging the raw materials of God's creation in such a way that it helps the world in general and people in particular thrive and flourish. We are continuing God's work of forming, filling, and subduing. Just as He subdued the earth in His work of creation, so He calls us now to labor as His representatives in a continuation and extension of that work of subduing. Active, creative engagement with the world so people thrive and flourish. So, our work contributes to shalom, which is that Hebrew word for harmony and flourishing in relationships, right relationship with God, with self, with others, and with all of creation. The Apostle Paul applies this to the New Covenant community of Christ followers, us, when he writes in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. He's not addressing here those people who for legitimate reasons are not able to work. He's calling out an unwillingness to work. Why? To refuse to work is a fundamental violation of our role as image bearers to follow and to reflect God in His work. As we read further in Genesis, the story of our first parents in the garden unfolds. We learn how our relationship to work becomes complicated. There are two inescapable realities about work, and these impact us every single day when we wake up and prepare to enter our own private gauntlet of responsibilities that we have in our work, these responsibilities that strain and stress us. First of all, work is a God-given blessing. It's a worthy, purposeful part of God's plan. It's not a punishment for us. It was woven into life in the original paradise. This is subtly and profoundly reinforced by the life of Jesus Christ. When God Himself took on humanity, 
being truly God and truly man, he invested his last three years in itinerant ministry, traveling, teaching, doing miracles, loving sacrificially, which led to the cross. Prior to that, he lived and worked up until around age of 30 as a carpenter. Dallas Willard, philosopher and Christian author on spiritual formation, writes this, If Jesus were to come today, as he did then, he could carry out his mission through most any decent and useful occupation. He could be a clerk or accountant in a hardware store, a computer repairman, a banker, an editor, doctor, waiter, teacher, farmhand, lab technician, or construction worker. He could run a house cleaning service or repair automobiles. In other words, if, you were to co- if he were to come today, he could very well do what you do. He could very well live in your apartment or house, hold down your job, have your education and life prospects, and live within your family surroundings and time. None of this would be the least hindrance to the eternal kind of life that was his by nature and becomes available to us through him. The dignity and value of human work is rooted in its origins, the fact that God has called mankind to meaningful labor. This concept of being called is central to an understanding of our work. A biblical worldview sees human work not merely as a job, but a calling. Now, the word that we use commonly, vocation, has its root in the Latin word for to call. Referring to one's vocation now has simply mean the job that you hold. But vocation means someone else has to call you to do it, and you do it for them rather than for yourself. A calling must have a caller. A calling is a summons. It's God's assignment to serve others. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, God has issued to you callings. Responsib- your responsibility is to discern them and to fulfill them. Christian com- calling, then, is the conviction that human existence contains a life purpose, a life task. Therefore, all we are and all we do, our identities, our gifts, and responsibilities, have a direction and a dynamic because we're li- they are lived out in response to a summons from God. Theologians designate our calling into two types, general calling and specific calling. General calling is a summons from God held in common by all Christians. This is a call for all believers, all times, in all cultures. The primary and initial call is to to salvation in Christ by faith. It then includes the biblical commands to worship the Lord with all of your life, to grow in Christ-like character, participate in the gospel culture of the church, engage in the mission of God's kingdom. Believers then also have a specific calling. This is a unique summons from God to an individual, to each one of us, based on a mix of our personhood, giftedness, responsibilities, and circumstances. This means that the Lord has something for each believer to be and do in this world, which infuses our life with direction and with purpose. These areas of specific calling could be a leadership role in the community, serving a ministry, marriage, parenting, or a certain career. So, first of all, work is a God-given blessing. Second, work is corrupted by the curse that's brought on by man's rebellion. We all recognize that the world is broken and troubled. Sickness, death, injustice, pain, natural disasters plague us and tear at the beauty and purposes of God. In response to man's open rebellion... The Lord brings a loving and just consequence that has redefined our work life. Genesis 3, 17, God announces, Cursed is the ground because of you, because of the rebellion of our first parents. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. God made us for work, but now it becomes painful toil. 
Work is not a curse, but it falls like other, all other aspects of life and creation under the curse of sin. All of our work will be marked by frustration and lack of fulfillment. We'll experience pain and conflict, fatigue, and not all of our goals will be met. Verse 18 said, Thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you shall eat plants of the field. So work yields for us both thorns and food. Our work will bear fruit, but not without a personal cost. It is going to be frustrating and also fulfilling. As it was this way in the beginning, it will not be forever. God has set in motion a restoration, a glorious return. The Messiah entered the world, one, and one day he's going to fully redeem all spec, aspects of creation and of our life, including our work. We celebrate this joy to the world when we sing these words at Christmas. These are probably familiar to you. No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Far as the curse is found. So it's interesting, isn't it, to, hear, to think about both natures of work, the glory and the beauty and the purpose of it, and then the reality of what we have to face every day and every week and every year of our lives, and we live with that dual reality. I think back on the jobs that I have had, the full-time jobs I've had, and I realize that the Lord has used those in my life to build my character and to order my loves and to shape my motivations. I think of painting houses, um, being in campus college ministry, working as a counselor in alcohol and drug treatment center, being a li liaison for a psych hospital to schools, being a public school counselor, and also then a pastoral staff member. And as I look back over that, I realized that more than one time I became lost in my own life and career. As a age of 30 in seminary, and I realized I was personally underdeveloped and really felt like I was not a fit for pastoral ministry. Later, I had to resign from a job <clears throat> that I loved and had to take a job for three and a half years that really exposed and magnified my weaknesses. And I had, and I had to be sustained in that reality. And then I realized that that was the very thing that I needed at that time for the growth in my character um, and as a worker. So the things that we're studying here this morning, I've learned by experience um, over the decades. So just as there's variety <clears throat> in seasons in my work, this is also true for you. So this morning as we talk about the nature and the challenges of our work, we're not just talking about a long career that a person might have. Just think of all the varieties of significant labor that's being done by those of us in this room this morning. I mean, some of us have part-time positions. That's not any less work than a full-time position, right, in terms of its impact in the world and its impact on you. There's virtual work from home or on the road. There's unpaid volunteer work, and this is not any less important. There's students. Your work as a student is submitting to training. If you're a student, your job right now is intellectual, skills, and character development. And then, of course, retirement. Stepping away from a paid career does not end one's significant contributions. I'm impressed here in our church family, those uh, that are retired, and, and watching and hearing about all the ways that you contribute to family, to this church body, to the community, and you're continuing to invest uh, by doing uh, real work. So all that we're talking about this morning relates to you if you're in one of these categories. Part-time work, volunteer work, student, retiree, working at home. It, do, it doesn't always, you don't have to attach money to work, right? To being paid for what you do, for it to be meaningful work that God is, is using. Now, for our second big question, how do we respond to the complexity of work? So this, that's the nature of work. How are we supposed to respond to it? Because it's blessed and it's cursed. It's frustrating and fulfilling. It's painful and promising. It's valuable and fleeting. 
And this is where we live. We live between all of these realities. So here are four biblical responses to our calling to be stewards as we uh, work alongside the Lord. First response, receive your work from God and do it unto Him. Colossians 3.17 supplies a motivation for our work. And whatever you do in word and deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God, the Father through Him. Consider the nearly invisible and mundane parts of your work. And then also the public and the monumental moments. These are all to be done in a manner worthy of Jesus and as an expression of gratitude for what He has done for you. We, off, we recognize that our work is a calling from God and we offer it to Him. Later in Colossians 3, Paul addresses slaves and their labor. Verse 22. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily, as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So the ex those exhortations, what were written uh, directly to bond servants, apply in principle to us in our work. Whatever the work, do it heartily, which means from the soul, which signifies a wholehearted endeavor. We're called to be dutiful, devoted workers, and the object of our efforts ultimately is not to please the people in authority, though we are dutiful, we are devoted, we are respectful. But ultimately, we're working for Christ. He is the one that we're serving. And He will give us a far better reward than any earthly master. This motivation brings our labor into the realms of excellence and joyful service and bringing honor to the one who gave me life and the capacities to work. Thus, my labor, my job, is a, my place of discipleship. I am learning from Jesus as I work how His rule is vital and real in the office, the field, the classroom, a hospital, the laundry room. And doing it unto the Lord means I'm opening myself to His work in me as I labor. God uses difficult people and seeming dead ends to smooth the rough edges of our character and bring about the beauty of patience, forbearance, forgiveness, perseverance, contentment, and sacrifice. So first of all, we receive our work from the Lord and we do it unto Him. Secondly, in your work, contribute to the common good. In your work, contribute to the common good. A commitment to the well-being of others and the flourishing of communities is reinforced in Scripture. A revealing occasion of this is when the prophet Jeremiah addresses the Hebrew people uh, in exile. So God's people were conquered by the Babylonians in 587 B.C. Their homes and their cities were overrun by violent oppressors. Many were, many were then taken into exile 500 miles away to Babylon, which is modern-day Baghdad, Baghdad, Iraq. So you live in Jerusalem, cities are burned, homes are destroyed, and you're taken 500 miles to Babylon to live. God's people are now a defeated ethnic minority. They're displaced into a foreign culture. They're disoriented with hurt and with hatred in their hearts. And what does God commend them to do? Through his prophet Jeremiah, he promises them, you will return from Babylon back to Jerusalem 70 years from now. And what are they to do in the meantime? Jeremiah 29, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. That tells you it's not random, right? There's purposes in this. I sent you to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city 
where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. They are to put down roots, pursue the normal life of hard work and raising families, and not just for themselves. God wants them to promote the common good of their captors and to pray for the city of Babylon. The New Testament continues the same theme of seeking the common good for all, with its emphasis on creating a distinctive, loving community, emulating the character of Jesus and spreading the gospel. The early church was also exhorted to do good for all. Galatians 6.10, So then, as we have opportunity, let us be doers of good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. 1 Thessalonians 5.15, See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Building upon this notion of the common good, the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century freshly animated the motivation and the identities of European workers. Martin Luther, the German reformer, was instrumental in renewing a vision for the value and the meaning of work. Jean Edward Veith, a contemporary author and scholar, explains Luther's teaching. God is graciously at work, caring for the human race through the work of other human beings. Behind the care we've received from our parents, the education we receive from our teachers, the benefits we receive from our spouse, employers, and our government stands God himself bestowing his blessings. The picture is of a vast, complex society of human beings with different talents and abilities. Each serves the other. Each is served by others. Because of the centrality of love, we are to depend on other human beings and ultimately through them on God. The purpose of one's vocation, whatever it might be, is serving others. It has to do with fulfilling Christ's injunction to love one's neighbor. Luther referred to our vocations as the masks of God. Your job, what you're doing, is a mask of God. Because behind the veil of your work is the providential care of the Lord for others. Thus, your work is part of a divine network of interdependence. God intends for you to serve others through your loving labor. So first, we receive our work from God and offer it to Him, do it unto Him. Second, in our work, we contribute to the common good. Third, in your work, bring about God's design and will for human flourishing. God's Word provides wisdom about human nature and what promotes our flourishing. In addition to joining all those around us and serving one another for the common good, God's people work to establish truth and righteousness and justice. In all arenas, such as education and law and business, government, medical care, the arts, and so forth, there are competing philosophies and practices that will either bring about that are either godly or ungodly, wise or foolish, healthy or destructive. The believer seeks to create cultures, goals, and structures in their work that reflect and further God's design for human life. What would it mean, I wonder, for you if you were to direct and to structure your work in ways that honor and follow God's aim for society? If you had that mindset and that motivation in what you were doing. If you manage people, how can you lead in a way that recognizes the value and rewards the effort of each person. If you teach, what truths would the Lord have for you to uphold? In business, how do you pursue profit without shelving ethical standards? As a student, what does it mean to be truly captivated by what the Lord wants you to know, rather than by more shallow motivations? In your home, how do you develop young people who love goodness and proper innocence, in a jaded, self-absorbed culture. In your particular field, how will policy breakers be treated justly, receiving appropriate consequences and more compelling questions in your field, the work that you do, 
Just fascinating questions for you to explore. Remember, we're gardeners who create and cultivate according to God's design. Thus, our gardens should recognizably resemble His patterns for truth and justice and for beauty. Your role is to influence as best you can your home, your company, your organization, your school, your community to move toward policies and plans and outcomes that line up with God's design. So we receive our work from God and do it unto Him. We contribute to the common good and we find ways to also build human flourishing. Lastly, in your work, be a witness for Christ. This brings to mind Jesus' words in Matthew 5, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So the image of being light portrays us as illuminating this sin-darkened world and then warns us against withdrawal or passivity, losing our distinctiveness or silence. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, 20th century German pastor, said, A community of Jesus which seeks to hide itself has ceased to follow him. In addition to visible works and all we've talked about thus far, being a witness includes a verbal component. That means that you establish a public identification with Jesus in some manner. In this way, a co-worker might want to know more about him. Of course, explain the importance of your relationship with the Lord and how you came to know Him through tr trusting Jesus Christ's life and His death and His resurrection. You're going to find someone who disagrees with that. Might bring some conversation, some differences of opinion. But that's all part of having that verbal witness is understanding that has happened over the course of the centuries and it's going to continue uh, to happen in our lives as well. These past Sunday mornings from Drew and Taylor and from, uh, from Derek, uh, we've been inspired and we've been equip equipped in many ways through these sermons to how to be and how to share um, the word of Christ, the understanding of who he is, his relationship with us, what he's done for us. How do, how do you talk about that and share that with other people? So our invitation this morning is to seek in the context of your vocation to be further equipped in establishing a fruitful public identification as a follower of Christ. I was thinking of one way that would be very enjoyable and fruitful to do this would be to get two, three people uh, who are in your same field of work uh, and read a book together. And so I have three here that would be excellent. If you, uh, for instance, are a business person, this is a book by Wayne Grudem, Business for the Glory of God, very Nice, thin, enjoyable book. Men, the men from our small group uh, a few years ago read this together. Uh, we get together once a month, read a chapter. It's a, it's a great book on business ethics and purposes. Uh, if you're a, a teacher, accountant, if you're an educator, the medical field, whatever your work, this is a book called Work Matters by Tom Nelson. It'd be an excellent study. And then again, whatever you're in, what fi whatever field you're in, and also if you're a homemaker, if you're someone who has a part-time job, find someone who's doing the same, same, same thing that you are doing here in this church body or at work or in your neighborhood. Pick this book up, Every Good Endeavor by, by Timothy Keller, and read it together. It'd be a great way to be able to grow together uh, with some people who are facing the same challenges uh, that you are. It's important for us to reach out to each other uh, because we know that... Uh, the culture is a challenge for us as believers currently. It's going to continue to be that way. There's a lot of us policies, trainings, and actions are being taken and enforced by some of your employers that are creating moral conflicts for you, issues of conscience, and these are not going to be going away. So there's wisdom for you to be able to work these things out with the support and shared wisdom of the Christian community. And there's just there's so many questions, so many issues that develop, 
uh, and they need to be nuanced and worked out in your life, in your place, before the Lord and with each other. So to conclude this morning, I have these implications. Seven simple statements, and each followed by a question. Number one, embrace the meaning and purposes of your work. Ask, where do I need to be renewed in my weariness about the dignity and the value of my job? Number two, don't ask more of your job than it can deliver. Ask, am I working ultimately for myself, seeking personal identity and fulfillment primarily through my work? Three, don't ask less of yourself than you should deliver. Ask, how can I better pursue excellence in my work, doing it unto the Lord? Four, don't give more of yourself than you should. Ask, is my work life out of balance? And if it is, why? Five, reinvigorate your desire to work for the common good in your calling. Ask, how does my work truly contribute to the common good? You can get into the, into the forest so much with the trees, you really don't understand. This is what I'm doing is actually helping people. How is God serving others through my service? Who am I loving through my work? Six, consider how to shape your workplace and influence its aims and practices to reflect God's design. Ask, how can the work I do and my organization, company, or home reflect a godly pattern of righteousness and human flourishing. And lastly, commit to explaining your hope in Christ to co-workers. Ask, how can I speak plainly and respectfully in my work environment to my colleagues about Jesus? So, I commend you for the work that you're doing, for the diligence and the faithfulness and the sacrifice that you're doing day by day and year by year. And in your good endeavors, God is pleased. And so may we find joy in serving others, doing our work unto the Lord, as Paul encourages us, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance of your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Lord, thank you for the gifts that you give us and the responsibilities. Uh, we are awed that you are a worker from the very beginning, that you find joy in that, and we experience the fruit of your creativity. We thank you for that. We also thank you for giving us the possibilities and the joys of working alongside you. We ask for you for your forgiveness of our rebellion, the rebellion of our first parents has affected us greatly, and Lord, as we're trapped in uh, the toil and the sweat and the frustrations of work, ask that you would sustain us in that. Lord, our real desire <clears throat> is to know you better, to give you pleasure, and to reflect you to this world. We pray you'd give us the capacities to do that. In Christ's name, amen.